Hey everybody, Chad Westport here, and we are back with another installment of the series with Dr. Mayabi Shields, and she is here to explain a little bit more about cannabis and your body. We have covered the endocannabinoid system on the previous episode, and today one thing that I want to talk about are the CB1 and the CB2 receptors, uh, just kind of what they are where they are, and maybe some of the binding potentials that these cannabinoids have. So Mayabi, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And this is uh, this is an interesting one because they're not as similar as you would think that they are. But to backtrack about, the, about how they fit in with the endocannabinoid system, the endocannabinoid system is a signaling system, and it is made up of these receptors like the cb1 and the cb2 receptors they are the things that are like light switches that get turned on by the endocannabinoids so endocannabinoids are molecules they are you know floating around molecules in our body and they bind to the receptors and then the last thing in the system is the enzymes which i mentioned last time are like little machines and a lot of the enzymes um, the machine, the job is to either create this or to deactivate it. Mm. And so that's what the enzymes do. They're like the little machines that are either creating or deactivating the, the molecules. And so the CB1 and CB2 receptor, how they fit in, they are the two main receptors of the endocannabinoid system. Now, I mentioned it also last week, there's more and more things that we've been discovering that are part of the endocannabinoid system. It's still growing. But for the most part, actually, the CB1 receptor is the most well characterized. We've studied it the most. Um, the CB2 receptor was discovered after it. Um, they do not share a lot of homology, which means that even though they are related to each other because they both interact with the endocannabinoids, they're pretty different in shape. And it does look like they are located in different parts and in different systems of the body. So like mm. usually people will say that the CB2 receptor is more associated with the immune system, whereas the CB1 receptor is more associated with like the central nervous system and the brain types of effects. Um, this is something that I think is debatable depending on what studies you're looking at and okay. what and who is doing that because like there are immune system cells in the brain right microglia is an entire class of, of brain cells that are immune system cells. Mm -hmm. And I once witnessed like two scientists who both studied the CB2 receptor kind of like not yelling at each other, but having like a heated discussion over whether or not they would say that the CB2 receptor was in the brain. Um, this was in 2016, so I'm not sure if mm -hmm. they've um, come to a consensus since then. <laughs> but um, it's something that definitely struck me and that we, we still are looking into both of these receptors. I mean, we didn't get a good structure of the CB1 receptor, I think until the last year of my PhD, I think it was 2018. So, I mm -hmm. mean, we are still really early in learning more about them, what they do, um, and in general, just about all receptors and what they do. But to just kind of give an overview of it, the receptors are these kind of like globular things, and they're these big sort of globby moving around things. And when the molecule, in this case, an endocannabinoid, or let's say THC, right, a phytocannabinoid, the molecule comes and activates that receptor, like the CB1 receptor or the CB2 receptor. When it, the when you say activate, what you mean is that the molecule is sticking into, it goes inside, or sometimes it sticks to the top. And when it does that, it actually changes the shape. And then all of a sudden the receptor mm -hmm. changes shape and that's what activates it. It's this three dimensional wow. change. And when that three dimensional change happens, all of a sudden there's a bunch of domino, it, it sets off a domino effect of things that end up occurring. And for the most part, both CB1 and CB2, the domino effect that it sets off will be to reduce like levels of excitability in in the brain. It's that's in general, it's not always true. And it's not always true depending on what parts you're talking about and whether or not there are other things present. Um, but there's this very, very long um, cascade of events and that is what leads to you feeling something. So it starts with the molecule binding to the receptor and then that big long domino chain of effect goes off and all of it happens just in like, nanoseconds, milliseconds, like wow. barely any time. And then you feel high. 
in a blink of the eye. Now, how do we know that they were there or how did we discover it? How do we see them? Is it like the the bioluminescence where it's neon on the screen and you get to see them doing their thing or how how did we come across that? Very, very cool question. So it depends uh, and it depends on the, that it, it, it is possible to use bioluminescence now. So that's called like, usually those are like fluorescent probes and basically it wouldn't look like this, but basically I actually, they have made some of them, but you take this molecule and pretend like you added, this is THC and pretend like you added a fluorescent like light to the end of here, right? Rudolph. And then this, it, yeah, exactly. And then this goes around in the brain and it binds everywhere in the brain and then you see the light. So okay. that that does exist, but I, to my knowledge, like the most research that's been done with cannabis with the cannabinoid receptors has actually been done with radioactive ligands. So mm. that means that they make a molecule like this, and usually it's not THC, it's something that will bind even stronger. Um, they make a molecule like this and they make it out of something that's radioactive, um, not in a harmful way radioactive because there's plenty of different types of radioactivity. And you will go and it and then it, it goes into the brain and then it binds there. And then when you take the scan, it'll light up with like, you have detectors specifically for that type of radioactivity. And that's how you can see, you know, where they are in the brain. Um, if people are interested in looking it up, it's PET scanning. Um, and people have like, I think people get PET scans regularly for cancer and other things. It's positron emission tomography, I think is what it, hmm. what it stands for. Um, and that's at the, that's at the larger, larger level of like, how did we, how did we even know? But I mean, to answer your question, I don't think that we knew for sure they existed until until the until the late nineties. And then right. in terms of finding them and cloning them, sometimes now more more recently, um, we know that they exist because of the DNA. So mm. we I, I can't remember when the genome was completed, but it also was fairly recent. I think it was like in the early two thousands was when we finally completely mapped the entire DNA of the human wow. genome. Um, you know, the things that are within us that make us who we are, the genes, our DNA. Um, we have a lot more in common than we do have different, even if that even if it doesn't always look or or feel that way. Um, we have a lot of things in common. And for the most part, all of us have a lot of the same genes um, and we have different variations of those genes. And at this point now that we have it all sequenced, so it's like a giant database of the sequence of all the DNA, we are actually able to go back in there and we're able to find um, receptors that are in the DNA that we didn't know about. And mm -hmm. there's a bunch of them that actually many of the new endocannabinoid system receptors were discovered this way. They're called orphaned receptors, um, kind of sad, but they're called <laughs> orphan, they're called orphan GPCRs. And, um, which is a G protein coupled receptor. That's the type of receptor that both CB1 and CB2 are. Um, Cause there's other types of receptors as well, but I think it's something like 75% of drugs target GPCRs. So they're, oh, wow. they're the biggest, they're like one of the largest classes of, of drug targets. And, 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 and sorry to interrupt you here, but and when you say drugs that, you know, includes pharmaceuticals, yeah. we're not talking like street drugs as well. You're I mean, no, yeah, all talking okay. pharmaceuticals, but yeah, the opioid, the mu opioid receptor is a GPCR, like serotonin receptors. Most of them are GPCRs. One of them is not for sure. Um, the dopamine D2 receptor is a GPCR. Um, and like there's exceptions like the, the GABA receptor is not right. So, I mean, but most of the, most of the targets, like a, a big chunk of them at least are okay. G protein coupled receptors. And so there's these new ones that they found in the genome. And that's how we've been discovering them more recently. And then we end up finding out that they're endocannabinoid receptors. Like um, GPR 55 is a pretty interesting one. If people want to deep dive into like one of the more recent endocannabinoid ones, um, there's been a good amount of research on that one. GPR 118 also seems to have like some good links to the endocannabinoid system, but hmm. they're, you know, they're, they aren't the super obvious ones. They're kind of like, right. we're, you know, we're still learning a lot about the brain and, and don't feel like the endocannabinoid system is the only one that is that unknown because it, it is true in the other areas too. Um, in terms of like dopamine and serotonin, there is a whole class of receptors called the trace amine receptors. They're TAR receptors. And so there is an entire class of trace amine receptors too, that are these, you know, they're, 
we're in this period of extreme, extreme rapid growth in neuroscience and receptors and pharmacology, because we finally have like advanced technology to look at it. And so there's just been, you know, giant changes in what we are able to see and to mm -hmm. study, you know, within even since there's been new technologies since I was out, like I like that I look at it and I'm like, wow, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, I, I think that I was sort of like, you know, I've always been in awe by science and by technology. And the first time that you see, so in terms of how do we know the shape of it too, it's this technique called X-ray crystallography and we can use X-rays and we shoot them at a crystal and, you know, in a camera for people who are, mm. who understand photos, like when the camera has a wavelength and then you take a picture of it, you're taking a picture of the light hitting the sensor, right? That's what the, that's what, is taking the picture. Um, and so our ability with a microscope to like zoom in, the the limitation on the size has to do with the size of the wavelength of light. Okay. So all so all visual microscopes, all of the microscopes that you just look in that have a light underneath them, stuff, they will all have a limitation based on the the length of light, like the wavelength of light. And so you use an X-ray the wavelength is much smaller. And so mm. you can see much smaller. Um, and you have to use a computer because it's a very complicated algorithm of a pattern that it spits out. It's also like when you see it with the computer, what you're seeing is not necessarily a picture. You're seeing like electron density, um, but you okay. can see it. You can see it looks like this. It's interesting. Like it, it will look like it. Like you'll actually, I'll have to send you like a photo of one of the renderings. Um, but it's incredible. It's incredible. To, like, it's, it's incredible that we can see it. I've always just been blown away by that. It like, I, I don't, I'm a big nerd when it comes to that kind of stuff. Well, it's super cool. It's fun. It's exciting. And darn it, it relates to our health. So I don't blame you for being excited about it. Uh, but that, you know, that's a great way to kind of wrap up this week here about what is the CB1 and the CB2 and other receptors that we're probably going to find a lot more in the future. Uh, any final words on this one before we uh, take it into the next week? I feel like I didn't talk enough about the CB2 receptor. <laughs> so one other thing really quickly about the CB1 and CB2 receptors that's actually really applicable to a lot of people is that uh, CBD actually does not have a very high affinity for either of those receptors, which means hmm. that it doesn't necessarily interact with those receptors. Um, it's been shown at really high doses to prevent other things from binding to it, and that in general, it can bind to the outside of at least the CB1 receptor. Um, mm -hmm. There's some people who believe that it like shares a similar spot with cholesterol, which I think is interesting, um, but it'll mm -hmm. bind to the outside of it and it'll turn it down like a dimmer switch. Um, one of the reasons why CBD can kind of cut the anxiety of THC and why I personally think that it's really valuable to be able to mix them and have them be available is that you can kind of moderate the way that your CB1 receptor is reacting um, by putting them together. That is awesome. And that is a perfect segue. Everybody tune in for the next installment of the special series with Dr. Mayabi Shields, because we are going to be talking about endocannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, affinity for each other, and how they're binding to the receptors. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in again. Uh, spread the word because this is important stuff. And I forgot to mention it last time, but all of her links and socials will be in the show notes. So please do go and learn more because she is just scratching the surface of what she can share with us. So appreciate you guys tuning in, and we'll catch you on the next one. Yay! Yeah. One, two, one, four!